The Witch of Blackbird Pond Chapter 5 These are the only clothes I have, protested Kit. If they are not suitable, I shall stay here with mercy. Through the crystal Sabbath morning, the meeting house bell tolled steadily. Matthew Wood stood on the threshold of his home, his bushy eyebrows massed close together as he surveyed the three women who waited to accompany him. Beside the plain blue homespun and white linen which modestly clothed Aunt Rachel and Judith, Kit's flowered silk gave her the look of some vivid tropical bird lighted by mistake on a strange shore. The modish bonnet with curling white feathers seemed to her uncle a crowning affront. You will mock the Lord's assembly with such frippery, he roared. This was the second time this morning that her uncle's wrath had descended on her head. An hour ago she had declined to go to meeting, saying airily that she and her grandfather had seldom attended divine service except for the Christmas Mass. What an uproar she had caused! There was no Church of England in Wethersfield, her uncle had informed her, and furthermore, since she was now a member of his household, she would forget her popish ideas and attend meeting like a God-fearing woman. This time, however, he was baffled. He knew as well as she that there were no garments to spare in the house. Rachel laid a placating hand on her husband's sleeve. Matthew, she pleaded, everyone knows that the child has not had time to get new clothes. Besides, it would be very wasteful to throw these aside. Catherine looks very pretty and I'm proud to have her go with us. Judith was certainly not proud of her. Judith was as outraged as her father, though for a different reason. Her pretty mouth had a sulky droop, and the long fringe of lashes barely hid the envy and rebellion in her blue eyes. This first venture outside her new home was not starting out auspiciously for Kit. But as they set out along the road, she could not repress her curiosity and bouncing spirits. If they were going to church, then there must be a town somewhere beyond this narrow road. Under a brilliant blue sky, Wethersfield held far more welcome than on that first foggy day. There was a delicious crispness in the air. The family walked along High Street, past a row of substantial frame houses, and came out on a small square clearing. Kit looked about eagerly. Is it far to the town? she whispered to Judith. There was silence. This is the town, said Judith stiffly. The town. Kit stared, too aghast to realize her own tactlessness. There was not a single stone building or shop in sight. The meeting house stood in the center of the clearing, a square, unpainted wooden structure topped by a small turret. As they crossed the clearing, Kit recoiled at the objects that stood between her and the meeting house. A pillory, a whipping post, and stocks. Inside the small building, on rows of benches, sat the good folk of Withersfield, Men on one side, women on the other. At the door, Matthew Wood left his family and moved with dignity to the deacon's bench directly in front of the pulpit. Rachel preceded the two girls down the aisle to the family bench. As Kit moved behind her, the astonishment of the assembled townspeople met her with the impact of a gathering wave. It was not so much a sound as a stillness so intent that it made her ears ring. She knew that her cheeks were flaming, but she held her head high under the feathered bonnet. The Puritan service seemed to her as plain and unlovely as the bare board walls of the meeting house. She felt a moment's surprise when her uncle stepped forward to line the psalm. His firm nasal voice set the tune and pace, one line at a time, and the congregation repeated it after him. By the time the long psalm was over, Kit was glad to sit down, but presently she longed to stand again. The hard edge of the narrow pew bit into her thigh. 
in spite of every gingerly effort to shift her weight. Kit's gaze flicked over the church folk. A very lot they were. Not all of them shared her uncle's opinions of seemly garb. Some were as fashionably dressed as Kit herself. But the majority were soberly and poorly clad. And here and there, in the furthest most pews, Kit glimpsed the familiar black faces that must be slaves. All of them, however, were alike in their reverent silence. How could they sit there without twitching a muscle, even with the black flies buzzing under their bonnet brims? It was impossible that they could be listening to the sermon. She could not keep her mind on it for an instant. A steady rustling sound told her that a few muscles were as unruly as hers. On the stairs leading to the gallery, nearly 20 small boys were clustered, shoulder to shoulder, and the solid ranks undulated with the constant jerking of restless elbows straining under tight woolen jackets. A rosy-cheeked boy on the second step with one fleeting motion captured a fly and held it imprisoned against his knees. Four boys nearest him were convulsed. Snickers spilled out past the hands they clasped over their mouths. A man stepped menacingly from the corner, brandishing a long pole, and Kit winced as two sharp raps descended on each luckless head. The cause of all the commotion sat serenely, his rapt, innocent gaze never straying from the minister's face, his hand still cupped over the imprisoned fly. Kit felt a giggle rising in her own throat, and looking frantically for distraction, caught John Holbrook's eye. He looked away without a sign of recognition. Bother these people. Look at Judith, sitting there with her hands folded in her lap. Didn't her feet ever go to sleep? Nevertheless, if this were a test of endurance, then she could see it through as well as these New Englanders. She tilted her chin so that one plume swept gracefully against her cheek, discreetly curled and uncurled her numb toes inside the kid's slippers, and set herself to endure. The sun slanted directly downward through the chinks in the roof when the sermon ended. It must have been a good two hours, and would, Kit suspected, have been much longer had not the minister's voice grown increasingly hoarse till it threatened to fail altogether. Kit rose thankfully for the final prayer and stood respectfully with the rest of the congregation till the minister had passed down the aisle to the door. Outside the meeting house, the Reverend Grisham Bulkley took Kit's hand in his. So this is the orphan from Barbados, he rasped. How grateful you must be, young lady, for the kindness of your aunt and uncle in your time of need. Two deacons also took her hand and stressed the word grateful. Had Uncle Matthew informed the whole town that he had taken her in out of charity? If so, then she was obviously a surprise to them by the suspicious and downright hostility with which the deacon's wives were surveying her from feathered hat to slippered toe. She did not look like a pauper. Let them make what they liked of that. Most of the churchgoers did not come near her. A little distance away, she glimpsed good wife Kroof, surrounded by a close huddle of whispering women, all darting venomous glances in Kit's direction. Kit turned a defiant back on them, but first she sent a friendly wave to Prudence, whose peaked little face turned pink with delight. With a flash of pleasure, she saw John Holbrook approaching, but her impulsive greeting froze as she saw that Reverend Bulkley had the young man firmly by the elbow. In the shadow of his teacher, an extra staidness had fallen over the young divinity student, and his smile was lukewarm with dignity. Not till John had courteously acknowledged the minister's introductions did he turn to Kit. I was glad to see you in meeting, he said gravely. You must have found the sermon uplifting. Kit was nonplussed. And I think we'll call it a day here and continue reading this in the next video. Till then, Tigger says ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for watching. I love you guys. Bye-bye.